This is day 26 of my six mark challenge for AQA GCSE Science. In the run up to the exams, each Monday to Saturday, I'm posting a new video with a six mark question so that you can practice your extended response answers and also check it and mark it afterwards to see how you've got on. You can find a link in the description below to each week's questions and also a playlist containing all 26 videos so far. For today's challenge, we have another one of these method questions. So as I pointed out before, this is not an essay question, even if they give you a whole sheet of A4 to fill in. You need to be laying out your ideas in a logical order, but there aren't any marks at all in GCC Science for writing in paragraphs or even in full sentences. So it's a really good idea to lay out your answer as bullet points or maybe a numbered list or even using a table. And another thing that I'd really recommend that you do is to kind of make yourself a little plan. So maybe find the six mark question at the start of the exam and then jot down your ideas as you're answering the rest of the paper so that when you're faced with those six minutes to answer the six mark question, you already know what you're going to say. The other thing to bear in mind is that particularly for these method questions, you really need to make sure that you've answered the full question and that your method would actually make sense and would allow someone to carry out this practical. If you haven't done so already, pause the video now and give yourself six minutes to answer this six mark question. It's a really good idea when you're writing a method for one of the required practicals, or in fact any practical, to start by explicitly noting down what your independent, dependent and control variables are. This is partly to get it clear in your head before you start writing, but also to give you a clear visual clue when you get to the end that you need to go back and make sure that you have mentioned to change the independent variable and you have mentioned to measure the dependent variable and you have identified what control variables you're keeping the same. It's really, really common for candidates to miss out one of these and therefore be capped at a much lower mark, even though they've said lots of really good information. Now, for this particular required practical, there isn't one specific chemical reaction that you need to have done. So you might never have put different metals in hydrochloric acid. You might have put different metals in copper sulfate, or you might have put magnesium in acid of different concentrations. But it's OK if you haven't done this specific practical because they've given you all the information in the question that you need and you have done some kind of temperature change practical. So here, the independent variable is going to be the different metals that are being added. And the clue there is the word different. Anything that is different or changing, that will be your independent variable. And you need to make sure that you have mentioned changing it. Then your dependent variable is the thing you measure, which here is the temperature change. And your control variables are all the other things that you're going to keep the same while you're changing that metal. So here it's going to be the volume of the hydrochloric acid, the concentration of the hydrochloric acid and the mass of the metal being added. As I write this method, you'll see why I recommend writing a little plan first, because I'm going to write this in the order that I would plan it in rather than the order I would want my examiner to read it. Now, as we said, the most important thing is that this method makes sense and would allow me to gather the data I need to answer the question. Well, the first thing that needs to happen is that the chemical reaction must take place. So somewhere in my method, I need to explicitly say that I'm going to add the metal to the acid. I also need to say at a bare minimum that I have measured the final temperature. Now, of course, that's not going to give me very accurate data because the starting temperature of the acid may fluctuate slightly. So really, I should measure the starting temperature as well. And as far as possible, I want to be naming my equipment in these method questions. So I'll say that I do that using a thermometer. Having done that, I'll be able to calculate the temperature change. So now I've got a chemical reaction and I've got some data that I'm gathering about the temperature change. At the end of this, I'm going to need to repeat it, doing it with different metals so that I can then compare what the impact is on the temperature change. So that's now my independent variable and my dependent variable covered. So to start with, I'm going to measure out a set volume of the acid. And personally, I always find it easier to just name a volume rather than saying do it again and use the same volume because it just takes more words. So it doesn't really matter whether you've gone for 10 or 20, as long as it's a sensible volume. And likewise, rather than saying it's the same concentration, I've just stated the concentration. And again, I've named the equipment that I'm using to do this. 
and I'm going to talk about doing this in an insulated cup with a lid because any reaction where I'm measuring the temperature change I want to keep the energy transfer within that vessel and if I was just using a glass beaker then a lot of the energy that's going to be released is going to be transferred to the surroundings and so my thermometer is not going to identify that that temperature change has happened. Next, I'm going to mention another control variable, i.e. the fact that I'm adding the same mass of metal every time. Again, it doesn't matter whether you said half a gram or a gram, as long as it's a sensible mass, or you could just say use the same mass of metal every time. But again, it takes you longer to write. And likewise, I've specified a volume here. I would mention that I'm going to stir this reaction because that's going to make my data better. And I would mention that I'm going to do the reaction for each individual metal multiple times, and I'm going to use that to calculate a mean temperature change for each metal. Now, as per usual, there is slightly more written on this slide than you actually need to have written down to get six marks. And that's not because I've included things that aren't in the GCSE, but it's because we've included some parts of this method which will give us better data, but that actually, even if we'd missed out, we would still have data that allowed us to answer the question. So in order to get a level two mark of three or four, you're going to have to have said something about adding the metal to the acid, because if you haven't done that, you're not going to get any useful data at all. And you're going to have to have said something about measuring the final temperature, because without that, we can't get any useful data. To get our level three answer where you get five or six marks, you're going to need to have mentioned that you changed the metal, because if you don't do that, you can't answer the question. You're going to need to mention measuring the starting and ending temperature because without that your data isn't really valid and you're going to need to have mentioned at least one control variable so ideally you will have talked about all three that we've mentioned but without any control variable at all you're definitely not going to get five marks then in terms of things that technically we could miss out Using this insulated cup with a lid is a really good idea and it will make your data more valid. But if what I'm interested in is the difference in temperature change when I add magnesium versus when I add iron, I'm still going to see that magnesium will release a lot more energy, even if I do it in a glass beaker. It's just that I might measure temperature changes of 10 degrees and one degree instead of 20 degrees and two degrees. So even if I missed out that step, my method would still allow me to collect valid data and therefore they can still give me five or six marks. Likewise, the stirring is going to make my data more repeatable because it's going to make sure that that solution is properly homogenized as it's reacting. But even if I didn't stir it, I would still find that magnesium would give me a much bigger temperature change than iron. And then also in terms of repeating the steps and calculating a mean temperature change, again, that's a really good way to remove error. But even if I just had one data point for each metal, I would still be able to get valid data. So you could still have missed out those three points and achieved six marks. Tomorrow's question comes from paper one of GCSE Physics. Don't forget, you can find a link in the description below to all of this week's questions and also the playlist containing all of the previous videos. Thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you again tomorrow for day 27 of the six mark challenge. If you found this video useful, then don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCC Science revision videos coming soon.